Welcome back everyone for this culminating part of our speaker symposium, Mental Health Equity is Health Equity. I'm thrilled for this and very personally excited for this next portion of our presentation. We have two just outstanding and inspirational keynote speakers here that we will be featuring for our audience this afternoon. Our efforts for this portion of the event was to ensure that we highlight representation and leadership as a key facet of equity advancement. So it is my honor to introduce you to our first keynote speaker, California Senator and physician, Dr. Richard Pan. As a previous chair of the Assembly Health Committee, previous chair of the Senate Budget Committee on Health and Human Services, and in his role as the chair of the Senate Health Committee, Dr. Pan has a deep understanding of health and mental health policy. He has specifically authored legislation on mental health, including championing school-based mental health services and increasing accountability of the Mental Health Services Act which is a major source of funding for mental health services at the state level. Senator Pan has also authored legislation focused on various health disparities and the disaggregation of data collected by healthcare providers. So we gain a deeper understanding of how disparities affect underserved communities, including the need for increased mental health and substance use disorder services. This year, Senator Pan authored legislation to highlight racism as a public health crisis and its lasting impacts on affected communities, particularly on their overall health. As chair of the health committees in both houses, and as chair of the Senate budget subcommittee, he has helped shape important reforms in mental health policy to ensure those services are on par with other physical health services and has worked tirelessly to shape annual state budgets to ensure these services are delivered equitably statewide. Senator Pan, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Well, thank you so very much and really appreciate this opportunity to speak at this uh, very distinguished and important uh, meeting here today. And, and I just want to first uh, begin by thanking uh, both uh, Congressman uh, Joseph Kennedy and uh, Dr. David Satcher uh, for their leadership, their careers, and actually advocating for mental health and for equity. And it's uh, really amazing to be able to have this opportunity to talk at the Kennedy Satcher uh, Mental Health uh, Conference so, uh, Senator. So really appreciate the opportunity. I'm Dr. Richard Pan. I'm a pediatrician. I actually uh, focused on developmental pediatrics. Uh, so uh, developmental health have a lot of intersections there. And uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm also a California state senator uh, and uh, have been a chair of, of the uh, Health Committee, as well as uh, still sit on the Budget Subcommittee of Health and Human Services and previously chaired uh, that committee as well. And uh, really appreciate this opportunity to be here today to talk about the importance of mental health equity. So I know that, uh, you know, why is mental health equity important uh, to me? Well, it's important because it's very, that we need to be sure that uh, everyone has uh, you know, equal access to, to mental health services. In fact, uh, as a physician who primarily takes care of uh, patients who are on the, our Medicaid system, uh, who practices in community health centers, and I still continue to volunteer at community health center uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, I know how challenging and uh, difficult it is for, uh, for people to not only uh, get mental health services, but also the challenges they face that, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, affecting their mental health. Uh, so when you are struggling with poverty, you're struggling with uh, challenges of uh, getting a job or homelessness, or you know you have kids who are you know are under resourced. That's extremely uh, stressful. Uh, but we also know that we also need to address the other sources of mental health challenges as well. And of course, by the way, as we talk about mental health, we should also remember that also should include uh, substance use uh, treatment as well. And uh, we, we need to be sure that uh, when we talk about mental health, some people prefer the term behavioral health because it's more inclusive, but we need, you know, those two go together and it's very, very important. And so being sure that we have mental health equity is really critical to, to overall health equity. And um, I would like to say that uh, it's so important that uh, we not sort of div divide the brain and saying it's, 
completely separate from the body. Um, you know, they, the, the two are connected. As a physician, I'll tell you that. Uh, the nervous system is part of the body. And so when we think about mental health, yeah, and we need to realize and, uh, that, you know, mental health conditions uh, sometimes have the same, you know, they have similar biological underpinnings. And, but unfortunately, we as a society have created the stigma around mental health and, uh, and, and substance use that we need to overcome to be sure there's truly equity as well. And so that's, that's so very important that uh, we, we address that. Now, I also chair the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. And uh, this has been a particularly challenging time uh, for people of all races, uh, particularly uh, communities of color. Uh, but the, and this has also been a particularly challenging time for the Asian Pacific Islander community as well. Um, so even as COVID was starting to spread before any public health interventions, uh, which were extremely necessary, happened, uh, unfortunately, Asians were already targeted uh, for as, as potentially being the um, falsely uh, as being uh, the instigators of this pandemic. And, uh, and we saw a lot of hate incidents directed toward API. Um, we also saw uh, uh, you know, attacks uh, and, and uh, we've been able to document uh, numerous uh, hate incidents as well. And this has of course had a tremendous impact on the community. The other, the other thing I should also mention is, is that how important it is to disaggregate the data. You know, when it came to COVID, COVID itself, uh, we need to recognize that the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community was particularly disproportionately affected. And in fact, uh, the death rate from COVID among the NHPI community is actually the highest of all the racial ethnic groups in California. So at least in California, they had uh, twice the death rate as um, over twice the death rate as we saw in uh, uh, the overall population. And so it's so very important to recognize these racial disparities and how important it is to also have this aggregated data. Certainly in the API community, we saw a wide, you know, we, we do see a wide range of uh, different results depending on uh, different subgroups, but certainly when it came to uh, uh, Asian hate, uh, that was pretty much across the board. And what are the consequences of that? <clears throat> well, uh, there are very significant consequences. Uh, so for example, we, we know that there are Asian uh, seniors who actually are suffering from starvation because they're afraid to go out of their homes to go and uh, get food because there's so much fear about going outside, seeing incident after incident of uh, basically a Asian seniors being attacked and even uh, killed uh, just for being in the street, walking on the streets. Uh, the, uh, we also know that uh, Asian families are more reluctant to send their kids to school in person because they're afraid of bullying that will happen to their children when they go to school, um, which is uh, so, uh, so the fact that you're afraid to send your kids to school, not because you're worried to you get affected with COVID, uh, although that is certainly a concern, uh, that you're afraid that your child would be attacked if they go to school in person. So these are very serious consequences. That already, unfortunately, overlie the, uh, the challenge of stigma uh, around mental health and also poor access to mental health as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, in fact, when we talk about access to mental health in the API community, um, language barriers are extremely um, serious as well. So, anyone who's tried to deliver mental health services know you need to be able to communicate with your patients. And if you don't have in language services, you are not going to be able to have. Uh, basically provide quality mental health services. <coughs> me. So it's so very important that we be sure that people have access in language access to mental health services as well to address uh, inequities in access to mental health. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, what are some of the things that we've tried to do to address this particular issue, to address these issues? So I should also mention that uh, this year in the uh, California state budget, we passed the API equity budget, uh, which is particularly targeted to the API community uh, to try to address many issues, uh, including bullying in schools, but also access to mental health services, uh, particularly for victims of uh, API hate violence and incidents. So we know that it's not just enough to uh, go and punish the people who instigate API hate, it also is important to support the survivors, to support the people who have been victimized, to make sure that they have 
access to mental health services so that they can ad to address the uh, the experience, you know, the horrific experiences. So we need to be sure that the that the community has access to those services. But the other thing I also want to mention is is that now it's not that California doesn't provide mental health services, but we need to have funding to build that bridge, right, between the community and the mental health services. So that's really what the funding is about. Because as I mentioned, you have cultural stigma, you have language barriers, uh, you also may not have providers who are in the community. So those are all things that need to be bridged. So frankly, the uh, API equity budgets, not about, well, this is money just for API mental health services. It's actually say, guess what? The state of California funds mental health services uh, through our Medi-Cal program, through Prop 63, but the API community doesn't necessarily have access to it, not be, because of these barriers. And we need to address, we need actually funding to address those barriers. And so, uh, so that's what was so particularly important about our API equity budget. Uh, certainly, I also want to recognize that this is not an issue that's unique to the API community. And we need to, of course, in trying to achieve mental health equity, be sure we build those bridges as well for other communities as well. Uh, the other thing I should also mention is, is that uh, we know our children are particularly uh, challenged uh, with COVID-19. And uh, in fact, the state of California, uh, in our, uh, again, in our most recent budget, uh, is committing $4 billion to uh, developing a new, uh, robust, a more robust children's mental health system. So, uh, you know, again, we budgeted the money, we now have to work on the implementation, but again, this is an opportunity for us in California to say, what are we going to do to be sure that it's an equitable system? We know our uh, youth community is even more diverse than our overall community. And that and addressing mental health equity, again, is so very important. But part of the idea of uh, the budgeting the $4 billion is also to be try to create a seamless system where uh, we uh, try to eliminate these barriers, for example, saying, oh, well, if you're in school, you go through the school system, but when you're out of school, you have to go through another system uh, to, to, try to, to try to create a more seamless system so that you know, people don't just stay in one place, right? They, they go to school, they, they're back at home, they may go to work, uh, they may have other environments they're in, and figuring out how we can build a more seamless system as well, where people don't have to try to navigate different types of things, but instead, uh, you know, we, we say, guess what? You need mental health services, let's get you mental health services. Not only like, okay, well, you're in school, so you get this here, and you're over there, you get that. So I think we've all had that experience right, trying to, you know, everyone says, okay, I will provide you services in my silo, but it doesn't cross over, and so we need to think about that as well, and, and certainly every time we create these silos, and I certainly understand where they come from, uh, but uh, given funding sources and so forth, but that makes it that much harder for people to get access to care. Now, I should also just uh, step back and, you know, said I'm in the legislature, I told you I was a pediatrician, Frankly, uh, I first I ran for office because I saw what happened to mental health access to my patients. So I said I'm a developmental pediatrician, um, and so I do focus on children who have uh, learning disabilities and uh, behavioral issues, uh, uh, and uh, particularly in school. Um, I should also mention that uh, my brother is a child psychiatrist, so we always argue about who, who does a better job uh, about these things. However, uh, frankly, back in 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession, I saw uh, children in my practice who had disruptions in their mental health services because of budget cuts that happened at the state. And uh, because of that, I got so frustrated, I decided I was gonna run for office because we needed to fix the system. And uh, so uh, no one thought I would be able to win uh, back uh, then. I was uh, just, uh, you know, I was actually in the wrong party in the wrong district. Uh, and uh, but, uh, but I did, and uh, so certainly, uh, you know, trying to be sure we achieve mental health equity uh, and greater access to mental health has been one of the uh, uh, most important things for me uh, uh, in the legislature. And so uh, certainly here in uh, California, we are trying to make strides. Uh, believe me, we're not perfect in any ways. In fact, uh, I held a hearing uh, in conjunction with the Steinberg Institute here uh, in California where uh, we talked about different innovations around the world and certainly saw what the um, other states are doing and so forth uh, and other countries. And uh, so thinking about what can we do to improve accountability? What can we do to improve our mental health systems? 
Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, we are continuing to try to move the needle forward. But again, it's so very important that we try to address this issue of mental health equity. Um, uh, so it's easy to design a system and say, hey, here's the system. Uh, but if it doesn't really meet the needs of our various communities, uh, then it's not doing its job. So it's a, so again, really appreciate that you're doing this conference. Uh, uh, and we're certainly as chair of the API Legislative Caucus, so uh, we are very interested, you know, in, in trying to figure out how do we improve access to mental health for our community, especially in the with given with the API, you know, uh, stop a Asian hate. Uh, but we also recognize that many of our uh, other communities of color uh, uh, as well are also suffering. Uh, uh, challenges as well. We think about uh, you know Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and what you know for the African American community or Latino community as well, um, especially with the attacks on them around uh, not only immigration but other types of things as well. Our LGBTQ community, other communities as well. So with that, uh, again, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to all of you, and uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to to uh, share with you at, at this conference. And uh, certainly happy to take any questions if that's uh, if that's something that uh, you're going to be doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Pan. We are taking questions. We've notified our attendees that for some reason Zoom is actually in this chat because in our are in our meeting because the chat function has for some reason been disabled. But they are sending questions via our email, which is Kennedy at msm.edu. Um, but I would I would actually maybe ask a question of you if you could, you know, is one that I there's two that I've asked all of our panelists to ask, answer. One is if if you consider yourself with someone as someone with lived experience. Uh, well, certainly, I, I think I am someone with uh, lived experience. Uh, so, um, you know, I mean, mental health is quite pervasive in our community. Unfortunately, because of stigma, we don't often uh, talk about it. Uh, so uh, it, it is it is something that affects uh, uh, many, many people. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would be uh, challenged to say anyone could say that they that they personally have never been touched by uh, mental health challenges. Uh, uh, they really thought about it. Uh, so I think, again, that that emphasizes why it's so important. Uh, we uh, not only have access to mental health, but we, we try to remove the stigma around mental health. Absolutely. I think the reason why I think some, a lot of our participants sent in that question ahead of time is they forget that we all have our own personal journey when we decide to take on equity work and what that means. Um, and so I appreciate that we've all candidly said, of course, we are people with lived experience. There's a reason why we here, we're here and, and what that looks like. The other question is one thing that maybe you could tell someone who's new to uh, this, a desire to advance equity what is what can they do you know what's the first step that they can take if they're feeling kind of overwhelmed with deciding to take uh, this challenge on that we've all taken on in our work well i, I think that uh there's a few things you can uh you can do uh first of all don't feel like you have to take on the whole world at the same time <laughs> so i uh you know when i've talked about advocacy and uh and, and mobilizing people, people are like, oh my God, it's so big. The problem's been around so long. You know, how can we do it? And, and I say, well, you know what? Um, you take on a piece at a time, right? And, uh, and you, know, you find like-minded people, uh, you connect with people, you work, you work together and, uh, you know, it, it, and you look for those opportunities where you can make uh, improvements and change. So, uh, so I say, it's like, network with people, find like-minded people to work together, uh, and uh, look for those opportunities. One of the things I mentioned in, in, in politics is, is that they talk about windows of opportunity, right? So what happens is you'll see something happen. And it seems like it happened so quickly, right, in policy. But actually, the reason it happened is because some people were working on it for a long time. And when the window of opportunity opened, uh, they took advantage of that window of opportunity to go and, 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 and push that uh, policy forward. It's not that it just sprang, you know, immediately at, at, at that opportunity. Unfortunately, these op windows of opportunities um, often don't last very long, so you have to be ready for them. Uh, but they do come come back and around again. So it's not that, hey, by the way, you know, if I miss that window, that's it. it we never have a chance to do it. So I encourage people, you know, uh, learn the issues, connect with people, learn learn the issues, build your coalitions, right? And uh, and even though it may sometimes seem like, well, nothing's happening right away, 
eventually that time will come. And it's sometimes quite surprising how quickly that will happen. So uh, uh, just, just keep working at it, uh, keep preparing, build your coalitions, build your alliances, and then uh, and, and that and that opportunity will open and, uh, and take advantage of it. I think that's so well put. You know, one of one of the things that's been a common theme throughout the past two days really is that knowledge is power, and the information and education people can equip themselves with can be so much. There's so much empowerment that comes from that, and what they can do to create sustainable, meaningful change. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this. I want to thank you as well for being a champion of equity in your own role, but also as a person, as a pediatrician, as a clinical provider, as a human on this planet. We need more people like you to be able to speak on why these issues are important and, of course, create an understanding why mental health equity is health equity. So, Dr. Richard Pan, I thank you so much for joining us at our forum, and we hope we can have you be a part of something again very soon. Well, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, we had one question just come in. Can oh, I yes. can I ask it? Please. Okay. Hold on. So I don't I don't it's being facilitated to me, but I actually Madri. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask it, Maya. You can say it out loud. Maya. Oh, there it is. Uh, we have a, a question from one of our panelists who said, um, could the speaker comment on, this is a very interesting question. It's, it's a little specific, but um, it, could the speaker comment on hypoxia trauma of the brain during childhood, subsequent learning disability, adolescent social failure, and resulting risk of mental illness and substance use in young adulthood. Is this a possible is a this a possible life course for a child to be on due to early childhood brain trauma? I think one of the challenges that we have to also discuss in the, in the behavioral health equity movement is that behavioral health equity encompasses so much. And so developmental disabilities and the disability movement has to be a part of this too. Um, so if you can just comment, you know, on the life course for a child who might be born with issues and things that we can do to create a better pathway for them. Yeah, well, um, I, I, again, as uh, not being a perinatal expert, uh, I, I think that I want to be cautious about talking about hypoxia, you know, exposure hypox hypoxia in uh, specifically. <laughs> You know, for example, hypoxia could lead to things like cerebral palsy, which, by the way, is not, that's a physical disorder. It's not a mental health disorder. Uh, and, uh, but we should, I should just point out that certainly different types of exposures and uh, uh, can certainly lead to uh, uh, developmental and mental health issues, uh, actually different times of infection. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly worried about COVID is, is that it looks like COVID itself affects uh, their ne neurological system. And so we're thinking about what's happening with long COVID and children. Uh, so we have both the environmental impacts of COVID, uh, said, you know, people staying at home, less social interaction, uh, things that we have to do to try to contain the spread of the disease, but then also uh, when children get infected, and we've seen a tremendous rise in children being infected, uh, what impact that has on, on, on their brain and uh, that infection. And we certainly know a variety of different infections do have an impact on the brain. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, environmental uh, things like hypoxia, um, I, I, you know, I, uh, I think that uh, certainly it's possible, but uh, also, I guess it depends on the particular circumstance and uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what sort of long-term impact it has. So, you know, hypoxia is sort of a general term about, you know, lack of oxygen to the brain. Uh, uh, um, I, I would I would probably have to defer to some of the experts in uh, in, 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 in that field uh, in terms of what the long term impact is. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate the answer and this, and the expertise anyway, Dr. Pan. Thank you so much and taking time of your very busy schedule to be a part of this conference. Um, we have so much follow up we'd like to be able to do, and hopefully you'll be able to be a part of that in the future. Um, Thank you again for the work that you do and for being the champion of equity that you are. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.
So we now move to our second keynote presentation and our culminating keynote presentation of our event. The status of health and mental health for tribal communities in America requires an important focus in our discussion um, at this symposium. American Indian and Alaska Native communities are disproportionately affected by health disparities, limited access to health and behavioral health care, and historical isolation from funding and policy due to negligent approaches to data collection. Institutional trauma and rural isolation have led to rates of mental illness, suicidality, and traumatic stress in Native communities that present an urgent need for the equity movement to come together and address. In response to the evident and gross invisibility that American Indian and Alaska Natives receive in the equity landscape, it was important to me as director of the Kennedy Satcher Center that our symposium feature a leader who identifies with and can speak to behavioral health equity in this population as our culminating keynote. It is my sincere honor to introduce you to my colleague in solidarity, Abigail Echohawk. Abigail, a member of the Pawnee Nation, has been recognized as a national leader in decolonizing data for Indigenous people by Indigenous people. She is the Executive Vice President of the Seattle Indian Health Board and the Director of the Urban Indian Health Institute, a tribal epidemiology center and one of a few of its kind. Abigail works to support the health and well being of urban Indian communities and tribal nations all across the United States. I am thrilled to welcome her important voice to our symposium. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be joining you here today. And I'm actually going to share my screen here um, because I'm one of those nerdy people who love a, a PowerPoint with pretty pictures. So um, thank you, everybody. I um, would like to, before I start my presentation, to um, let you all know that I am going to be, um, I want to be cognizant of your mental health. And my presentation is going to contain descriptions and discussions of physical violence, sexual violence, spiritual violence, and the ongoing suppression and genocide of American Indians and Alaska Natives. And I do recognize that many of us hold personal experiences in this, and I want you to take care of yourselves. So step away as you need. And for those who are non-people of color, white people, what I want you to do is to sit in the uncomfortableness of the racism that I'll be discussing. I want you to sit in what feels like something you can step away from, but I never can. In the indigenous communities, when we tell a story, what it means with a story is that with that comes responsibility. So today I'm going to be sharing with you the stories of my community, and I will be giving you some of the responsibility of what it means to think about mental health equity and health equity with indigenous communities. And I wanna thank the Satcher Institute for when you sent me the questions and it said, what is your personal experiences? Generally, I always share my personal experiences because as an indigenous person working in the research data epidemiology fields, um, we're often told we're supposed to stay back from our personal experiences and they don't and don't contribute to who we are as scientists. But I am an indigenous scientist following in thousands of years of science of my ancestors who always did their research for one reason and one reason only, because we loved our people, not because we wanted published in a paper, not because we were looking for accolades or pats on the back, but because the future of our next generations is what matters and will always matter the most. So today I'm gonna to share with you my stories and the stories of my community, those I have the permission to share. So I will share the experiences of our community, both in the incredible atrocities and then the strength, the rebuilding of beauty, strength, culture, and always looking forward to not 10 generations in the future, but 10,000 years in the future for American Indian and Alaska Native communities. We can't have this conversation without walking through truth. My dear friend, Dr. Don Warren in Oglala Lakota, he always says to reach equity, we have to walk through truth. And in doing so, we have to recognize that if you are in the United States right now, you are sitting on the bloody genocidal land of my ancestors that was stolen from us. You are benefiting from the enslavement of individuals and from the oppression and suppression of other minority populations and marginalized communities within this United States. And until we start with that acknowledgement, we will never reach equity. And in my personal experience, I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation. I hold dual citizenship here in the United States with my tribe and as a US citizen. I was also born and raised in the heart of Alaska amongst the upper Atna Athabascan people, my mother's people in the heart of Alaska where I would stand my feet in a creek and look towards the mountains and I would know who I was and who my responsibilities were too. That is what has shaped me as an individual and what shaped my parents and my ancestors and my children and their children's children. 
But that land was often what was taken from us because they wanted our water, they wanted our mountains, they wanted our timber, they wanted the resources that Mother Earth held and they wanted to strip from her. And to do so, they took it from us. The Pawnee Nation in 1830 was estimated to be a population of 38,000. We were removed from our lands in Nebraska in Kansas in 1876 and by the census of 1910 on our two square mile foot reservation in Pawnee, Oklahoma, the census estimated at the census we are a little less than 600. More than 92% of our population had died in less than 100 years. I am a direct descendant of a genocide. I am a tangible manifestation of my ancestors' resiliency. They survived so I could thrive. My ancestor, the very first Echo Hawk, he was number 534 on that US census. I think of that data often because what does that mean in my responsibility to him and to my people? And what was the trauma my ancestor experienced that I have now seen passed down generation after generation after generation? My father used to go and visit the last family who was alive from that walk from Nebraska to Oklahoma where people were just dying every single day, where they were leaving the bodies of children, of grandparents on the sides of paths where they could never go and bury them and conduct those ceremonies. My ancestor left his wife. He left four of his children. He experienced trauma like I could never even imagine, but yet I've experienced his trauma as a result of what has been passed down generation to generation and the coping skills that my people developed to deal with the immense trauma of an ongoing genocide. Because the attempts to eliminate native people in this country and to take our resources and theft of our land and of our people has not stopped. And in fact, something that harmed my people probably happened five minutes ago. These stories are one that are present and they are here today. As we think about the theft of our land, the harm and the ongoing harm and trauma of our people and the ways that they coped, whether it be with different substances, with coping strategies where perhaps they compartmentalized and weren't able to parent their children correctly, we have to recognize that today, September 30th, or sorry, September 29th, we are coming upon what is the National Week of Remembrance of our boarding school survivors. And this is a picture of my relatives in Alaska. The boarding school system was where the United States under the, um, in the late 1800s under the leadership of a man named General Pratt, who had worked in the prison systems, decided that the best way to assimilate and to take out the savage, as they call it, of native people, is they would remove all of the children from the parents for no other reason than they were native. They weren't mistreating them. They just went and they took our children. And they put them in these boarding schools across the United States. The last one closed in 1993. These are the experiences of my relatives whose children were taken from them, put into schools where they were brutalized. They had needles stuck in their tongues because they spoke traditional languages. Their heads were shaved. They weren't allowed to speak their traditional tongues. And in fact, this is a picture of my relatives. They were in Glen Allen, Alaska. They took a dog sled there where they were then picked up by a bus that was taken to the Wrangell Boarding Institute in Wrangell, Alaska. My grandma, Katie John, who is standing back there, of her 14 children, nine of them were taken in this way. The others were seen as too old. They only took those under the age of 14 in her community. And I'm gonna tell you the story of my uncle Fred John and I have permission to share his story. I was raised with my uncle Fred John and saw him experience incredible substance misuse. He'd be here and then he wouldn't be here. Um, there would be issues within the household and then he would be gone. For years, we saw him struggle with his substance abuse and I didn't know his story. What I didn't know is he was taken when he was seven years old and placed in the school. And for two years, they didn't even give him the dignity of a name. He only was number 77. When he came back, his mother, my grandma Katie, attempted to hide the children. She took them in a dog sled across the state of Alaska and tried to hide them, but the winter was so cold and they were starving and they were dying. She had to take them back and they took them again. And so my grandma treated her pain with alcohol. So when my uncle Fred John came back, he couldn't even speak to his mother correctly because her first language was Athabascan. He didn't know his place within the community because he hadn't been able to learn those essential skills. And then he had lost the dignity of his name. And as a young child, we do know that uh, attachment theory where you learn as young children how to parent. He then struggled with parenting his own children, which included me as his niece and his, his children. And for many years he struggled. 
This is the experience of boarding school survivors across the nation. In my agency right now, 60% of our elders program are boarding school survivors. 40% of our elders program are currently homeless and experiencing substance misuse. And in Canada, just some months ago, it was discovered on the grounds of one of these boarding schools, a mass grave of 213 children. Many of our children never came back and their mothers cried and they wept for them and they never had any closure and they never conducted the ceremonies to understand what happened to their babies. And they treated their trauma in a variety of different ways. Some of it was the strength of like my grandma Katie, who eight years after they took her children, established a school which is still called the Mentasta Katie John School so that they would be forced to allow the children to stay in our community. She brought in a teacher in a one room school room and that school still stands today. She brought back her children. That was her way of coping and overcoming her substance misuse. But not everybody has had that same opportunity. This is a legacy of these boarding schools and these other traumas within our community that have deeply impacted our mental health. But yet when we look at the Indian Health Service who is responsible for and in a system that we prepaid for through our treaties, the Indian healthcare system is chronically underfunded and very often operates with less than 40% of need in their operating budget. In a governmental office of accountability report, they found that there was a, on average, 25% of all um, medical positions, including behavioral health, there was nobody to fill them. I have walked into clinic after clinic after clinic with empty rooms because there are no providers. And mental health and behavioral health is one of our biggest struggles. I recently did research with survivors of sexual violence and their experiences um, in the last year in the impact of COVID-19. And one of them said, she said, one of my struggles was is I would go to counseling and it would be a non-native person because we didn't have any of our Indian health service folks who could help us out. And they didn't understand what had been happening in our community. She said, I quit going because my counselors always cry. And she's like, I'm hurting them. What we are asking for is investment in and the actual investment in the Indian healthcare system to begin to provide resources to our tribal communities, but also improving the workforce and ensuring that there are native providers and culturally attuned care of non-native providers who can do more than sit and cry because they've never heard of trauma like we've experienced. But unfortunately, that's not the first time I've heard that story, but it should be. When we talk about historical trauma, this was defined for the Native community by Dr. Brave, Braveheart, an incredible woman. And she defined it really looking at what had happened across um, and looking at what research had been going on with survivors of the Holocaust. And we look at this as a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over a lifespan of generations. And with that comes this unresolved grief. We have this unresolved grief within our communities. And we have coped in a variety of different ways. I just talked to you about the boarding schools. When we talk about the boarding schools, the sexual violence was not only documented, but rampant. We actually had the archdiocese here in Seattle, Washington, where um, a lawsuit was brought against them by the state, uh, by survivors in Alaska. And they had sent all of their pedophile priests into villages in Alaska, where they then brutalized in these schools. Um, and across the state of Alaska, sexual abuse against um, Alaska Native children. That's not the only example. We then saw these cycles of violence be replicated within their communities. I experienced sexual violence at the age of six years old for the very first time. And it was actually by a Native person who had been raped themselves within a boarding school. I attempted suicide for the first time when I was seven years old as a result of the ongoing trauma when my parents went to the police and they said, our daughter is being sexually brutalized, she's been raped, help us. The police said, this happened on Indian land. She's a native girl and they never did anything. These are the stories of indigenous women and children across the nation. And in fact, there's a maze of jurisdiction that very often, I just worked with a family recently um, related to a missing person where this young girl was being trafficked and was missing. And um, it took them three days to decide who had jurisdiction. And in that three days, she had gotten so far away from us, we couldn't find her. This maze of jurisdiction has created a loophole in policy so that these people who are still perpetuating trauma against us are allowed to do so with very little repercussions. The mental health of mothers that I've sat in groups with, 
where we discussed not how to prevent rape in our communities, but what we do when their children are inevitably raped, have an incredible mental health impact. I did a study in the city of Seattle with American Indian Alaska Native women um, related to sexual violence. And what we found out of the women we talked to, 94% had been raped or coerced into sex in their lifetime. Only 8% of them saw a conviction of their rapist within the justice system or the injustice system, depending on how you look at it. However, a majority of them also talked about being affected by historical trauma and there are measures of historical trauma in which we use. And those measures of historical trauma allow us to understand where there are cultural protective factors that we can bring in to support them in the midst of this. But we can correlate their sexual violence, which is replicated by these systems of inequity that are perpetuated through US governmental policies and through systems of inequity that don't care that I was a rape victim that don't care that I sit with young girls talking to them about to how to cope with their sexual assaults. And instead, they wanna talk about substance misuse. They wanna talk about them living on the streets or their suicidality. We don't have an opioid problem in Indian country. We don't have a homeless problem in Indian country. I'm talking about the entire nation. We don't have a suicide problem. We have a problem of trauma. And we have a problem of institutional and structural racism that is still killing us today. And until the equity conversations go back to the understanding of the historical trauma and the ongoing perpetuation of that, we will never address mental health equity. And I will still sit in circles where we talk about what to do when they are raped, because I can't ever tell them with any certainty that they won't be. I've also done a lot of work on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And when we talk about the mental health impacts in our community right now, this is one having incredible impacts. And in fact, I helped the state of Wyoming author a report um, in early January where we found more than 700 missing and murdered indigenous peoples in the state of Wyoming. We had active missing person cases that had happened within days of that report. And yet when a young white woman goes missing, the Gabby Paterno case, all of a sudden, there's people searching, there's newscasts, everything happening. We couldn't get anybody to care for more than 700 Native people. And I'm not saying the family of Gabby Paterno didn't deserve that. They deserved that kind of support, but so do the Native people. And in fact, this report was done by a small organization. I, I self-funded this report. It cost me $20,000 when the federal government told me it'd take a couple million dollars and they'd have to get an allocation of from Congress. This report in 2018, which I re released at the US Capitol with Senator Lisa Murkowski, has been used to pass more than 30 pieces of legislation and supported two pieces of federal legislation. Led by indigenous women, women myself and Anita Lucchese, with $20,000 and the heart of our ancestors behind us. But what kind of impact does that have on our own mental health? We see this graph all the time. I mean, I've seen every iteration. No fence, yes fence, bicycles, same heights, you know, as we talk about equity. But my question is, is why are we looking at the same game? The impact on what has happened to my community is not the same that has happened in the Hispanic Latinx community. We need interventions. We need equity efforts that allow us to be who we are and recognize the strengths that we have in our communities. We have the answers. And in fact, in this picture, it's a native woman, her feet are on the ground, her eyes are to the mountain. She has her child on her back in a cradle board, which under the Academy of Pediatrics meets every, every way they want safe sleep to happen, but was one of the first practices that was taken from us. We now have some of the highest rates of sudden infant death syndrome and the need to increase safe sleep within our communities. We are restoring that connection to our cultures and to our communities through the strength of our communities. And I wanna tell you the story, and I'll probably end on this, of an incredible woman, because the strength of our communities is what is leading us forward. I was doing a research study around childhood parenting and also doing some work on suicide. And I was working with a tribe and during the lunch, we had sat down with some elders and we brought them in lunch um, and we weren't doing our research part. And one of the women was sitting next to me and she kind of leaned over and she's an older, beautiful elder, just beautiful, gorgeous hair, uh, the wrinkles I wanna have when I grow up. And she leaned her head against my shoulder and she said, Abigail, I wanna tell you a story. And she told me, she said, I was taken from my family when I was 12 years old and I was putting in a boarding school in California. And in that boarding school, I experienced all the things that we all talk about, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. But she said, but then I got to go home when I was 15. And then I met this incredible man. 
And when I got 18, we got married. And she said, we tried so hard to have babies and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting pregnant. And so she went to the doctor and what she found out is that when she was in that boarding school, she had been forcibly sterilized as many indigenous women were by the Indian Health Service during the 1970s. A government office of accountability report found that there was mass sterilization, unwanted, unvoluntary sterilization of American Indian Alaska Native women. And she had experienced that. And she told me as she had tears running down her eyes and her cheek was against my shoulder. She said, I'm here because I'm the best auntie. I've taken care of all of the children of my sisters and of my relatives around me. But she said, I can see why they would consider suicide because I did. Nobody talked to me about the fact that they took my right to have children from me. Nobody said this was unjust and nobody has ever cared. My team and I attempted to put in a paper we were putting through the CDC clearance process in 2019 references to the sterilization through and cited a government office of accountability report. And it came back from the CDC reviewers and it said to take out that section and that, that paragraph because it was inflammatory and unnecessary as we talked about historical trauma in Indian country. These experiences and the suppression of them and the oppression of our communities is continuing, even in the academic world where we did have to take it out because they wouldn't publish our paper that we needed to publish on chronic disease prevention. We see systematic racism embedded in our systems. So now as a Native woman who had responsibility to that story and to the tears that wet the sleeve on my shoulder, to that woman who held my hand in her very warm hand and kissed me when she left, I had to take out her story because the government didn't want it published. These are the experiences of our communities. And for individuals like myself who have been affected by the violence, who have been affected by the historical trauma, who work and deal to cope with them, we struggle to find the right ways and the right paths forward. I told that story along with some others at the American Association of Suicidology Conference in April, directly after that conference. Um, the CEO at the time was contacted by individuals at the CDC who um, attempted to discredit me and to ask that my um, talk not be shared and for me to justify the words that I had said. We see the systematic racism play out and it is always a risk for people of color my, like myself. And I am very lucky because in this year, it wouldn't have been 10 years ago, I carry immense privilege. I have contact within the, within the government. I was actually able to reach the secretary of HHS to discuss why this attack was happening on me when I had all of the proof of what I said. I had all of the citations. When we talk about mental health and mental health equity, when we talk about these systems of inequity, we have to recognize they are active today. They are working to suppress the voices like mine, the voices like other people of color, of these beautiful women who sit and hold their babies. And what we are doing instead is pushing towards justice, demanding justice. I've been called a troublemaker a couple of times. I'm like, since when is demanding justice trouble? Because we want historical healing. We're going to gather and we are gathering and stitching back together all of these pieces that have been broken apart. Because I go back to that, that woman and her beautiful eyes full of tears, who is sitting in a room, sharing her strength, her expertise, and her story to me, so we could heal. And in fact, in the American Indian Alaska Native community around suicidality, chronic health disparities, and any other health disparity within our communities, the only time we have seen discernible differences is when they have been grounded in our culture and tradition. When they have been these boxes of interventions that are plopped into our community, they don't work. They don't do anything. And in fact, the most successful in public health intervention, um, one of the most successful the CDC has ever had is a special diabetes program for Indians that is specifically adapted by every single tribe for their individual communities and culture. And you know what? It goes out of fidelity of what the CDC normally says is a diabetes prevention program. But what we've seen in the last 10 years is more than a 50% decrease in end-stage renal failure as a result of culturally-based interventions. Dr. Emma Elliott is working in suicide prevention amongst Native youth. And what she has found in her research is that land-based and connection to culture 
is where we see the building of hope and of strength within our youth more than any other suicide prevention program. It is our culture that heals. It is our elders who tell us the story. They are our strength. They are our community. And right now in the midst of COVID-19, I have been watching them die on all sides of me. And that mental health impact of being more likely, 3.5 times more likely to contract COVID-19, almost two times more likely to die from COVID-19, and to see this impact in our community where we are losing the essential people that are the ones who are our healing. These chronic health disparities in this pandemic are doing what systems of oppression and racism meant to do. They're killing my people. I've personally lost six, all under the ages of 55 during this pandemic. And this is not a unique circumstance, but our people are healing, they are thriving, and we are the ones providing the efforts and building forward the strengths. Don't come to us because we have the problems, but because we have the answers. And I'm just gonna share one last thing with you in my last minute. Um, the Seattle Indian Health Board, we asked for PPE in the pandemic and we were sent body bags instead. Unbelievable, we had no PPE. What I, as an artist, I'm also an artist and a poet. I actually took one of those body bags and turned it into a healing dress in our communities that is called a ribbon dress. It was recently featured in Vogue, which was shocking to me. Um, but that's what we have always done and what we always will do. We have the answers within our community. I can take this dress to my community and talk about getting vaccinated and my people understand. I can take this dress and I can say, we need to address missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and other communities understand. Our cultures, our stories, our ways of knowledge and knowing, that is our healing. And if we are going to actually reach equity, it can't be a neat tidy boxes of Western ideals of what that is. It can be grounded in systematic racism that exists within the equity movements that doesn't want voices like mine or yours or others who challenge. We have to be challenging and we have to change. And what I ask of all of you is today is how big is your brave? What is the change that you will make? What is the trouble that you will get into? And where is the community where you will sit in silence with an elder telling you a story maybe leaning on your shoulder, crying tears so that you can see the path forward to cultural humility, to health equity, and to justice, not just for Native people, but for all people. Abigail, I am so moved by your words. I can feel just a, a presence of strength that comes from you. And I thank you so much for so candidly sharing your family's journey, your people's journey, and being so honest with us about what it takes to actually push the envelope. Your time is very valued to, to me personally, but also very valued to the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. And we thank you so much for being the champion for people that you are. Thank you. It is a privilege to serve my community. I have not seen any questions come through. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of our inaugural event. I wanna close us with a few words from myself. Um, my deepest gratitude to the APA Foundation, to the keynote speakers, to the panelists, the collaborators who came together to make this moment a reality. At the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, it's my priority that we continue to utilize our platform to create spaces where we push the envelope further along in our quest for equity. I know that it means discomfort, I know it sometimes feels very unfamiliar to a lot of people to have dis discussions like this. I came into this position after being on the front line as a mobile unit director during COVID-19. And I'm also the daughter of immigrants and a woman of color. I have seen firsthand what our behavioral health care system can look like when it fails to be able to meet the needs of our most vulnerable. The COVID-19 pandemic plagued us alongside a parallel pandemic of social injustice that has been ongoing for years. This period has left us with an unprecedented mental health crisis across all facets of society. It is very easy for all of us who have come together over the last two days to feel defeated. And I really challenge all of you to not. This is a critical time for us to come together and think through sustainable solutions 
much like those that were presented so beautifully and meaningfully and so candidly in the dialogue we heard over the last two days. What an opportunity to rebuild our system and make it one that truly represents and, it, and is accessible to the rich diversity that makes up our country. I will speak for myself that I walk away from this symposium inspired, motivated, and hopeful to think critically and differently about my own role in leadership and how that can interface with all of you who have joined us with a similar vested interest in positive change. I thank you all for your commitment to mental health and behavioral health equity. I truly believe that the key to sustainable change lies in what I often tell my students are the three C's, communication, compassion, and community. I've seen it work as a mental health clinician and I see it working as an entire movement. Thank you for being a part of making those three C's a reality during this symposium. Mental health equity is health equity. We cannot have one without the other. I thank you all for joining us. Please be sure to complete our post event survey to help us better improve our future programming and be on the lookout for communication from the Kennedy Satcher Center regarding what comes next. We have a lot planned already from this amazing symposium. I wish you all health, safety, and wellness as we push onwards in our quest for equity for all.